God tries to get people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God tries all the time. His outstretched arm. He laments this fact. First of all, in Romans chapter number 10, verse 21, Paul speaking, and says, but to Israel, and Israel, well, Christians are a type of Israel too, so the mistakes that Israel's made, we as New Testament believers also make, can make at least. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. How long? All day long. That means every day. Every day, the Lord's trying to reach people with the truth. Every day. Now go back to Isaiah chapter number 65, and this is where Paul refers to in Romans, but now in Isaiah 65, verse number 1. Here's where Paul got that idea from. Isaiah 65, verse 1 says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not, meaning non-Israel people, non israelitish people. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Verse 2, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walked in a way that was not good, after their own thoughts, not God's thoughts. Now verse 3, a people that provoked me to anger. Can actions that people do cause God to become angry? Well, that's what it says in verse 3. A people that provoke me, they provoke God to anger continually to my face. Wow, what, what audacity. What nerve. Now he talks about some of the specifics, some of the false religions that they practice. That sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable, notice that word abominable things, is in their vessels, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. One thing God can't stand is spiritual pride. And here's some individuals there that they thought they were more holy than other people. Beware of spiritual pride, like the Pharisees. Then it goes on in verse 5. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense unto their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me. They blasphemed their God. They blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work unto their bosom. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. Father, please help me as I bring out this thought about how good you are and how, how you try to reach people in different ways. And Father, for those that are here this morning that have been reached already, we praise the Lord for that. But Father, for those that still need to be reached, may they recognize more clearly that you're trying to reach them and reach them so they will repent of their sins and by faith believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, may they recognize and realize that this morning, that they are trying to be reached, that you're trying to reach them, that your arm and your hand is stretched out to them this very day. So help me as I preach. Give me clearness of thought and words, for it is in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. And that's mainly what I want to emphasize this morning and let you know that God is trying to reach you. Now, there's certain things He will not do in trying to reach you, and there's certain ways that He uses, certain ways and certain methods. Now, has God been trying to reach you? Have you ever thought about that? Has God been trying to reach you? And to tell you something or let you know something or learn something. Has God been trying to reach you with some kind of message? And if he has been trying to reach you, how do you recognize it? How do you know this is from the Lord? 
Well, that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. First of all, the goodness of the Lord talks about it here. His outstretched arm, his hand that's reaching out to people. Please, will you come out? You know, as, as someone would plead with somebody. Here's the answers. Here's what you need. Here's what I'm trying to do. Will you please? I mean, if you get desperate with somebody and you start to plead with them because you want them to do something or you want them to believe something, you might even use that physical gesture of reaching out to them like this. Will you please come to me? Will you please listen to what I have to say? Well, that's what God is talking about here. Let's talk about some of the ways that God is trying to reach people, and maybe even you this morning. Some of the ways that God uses to reach us. Number one, number one. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. One way that God tries to reach us and gives us opportunity to be saved is He delays His judgments. God does not punish people immediately. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 10 and verse 11, if I can remember it from memory, uh, verse 10 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the Son of Man is fully set in them to do evil. If a sinner do evil, a sin a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet shall I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, with them that do what's right. So even though it seems like sinners are getting away with it uh, and they do sins by the dozens, by the hundreds, and there does not seem to come any judgment, there will be someday. But there's a reason that God is holding off on his judgment. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And this is one of the ways he's trying to reach people. By holding back the righteous judgment he should have against us. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. As you look at that verse, you see that, first of all, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You see, some people mistake God's delay of judgment as meaning that he's really not going to judge you for your sins. Because you sin one day and the next day there's no judgment. The next week there's no judgment. The next month there's no judgment. The next year there's no judgment. And you think, well, God didn't really mean that then, did he? Oh, he meant it. He meant it. And once the judgment comes, it comes quickly, suddenly. But number one, God holds back his judgment on people. He holds back that judgment because he wants to give us time to do something. He wants to give us an opportunity to do something. According to verse number 9 in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, what is that something he wants us to do? Repent. Repent. Turn from your sin. What sin? Whatever sin the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you of. With uh, the woman at the well, it was her immorality. She had to turn from that. With Nicodemus, it was his spiritual pride. With the rich young ruler, he had to turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to sell all his money because like we heard this morning, materialism is something that keeps people away from the Lord. So there it is. He's holding back the judgments, holding back the judgments because he wants to give us a chance, an opportunity, a certain time to repent of our sins and then also believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, how does God appeal to us? He holds back judgment. Friends, let me tell you this. You say, well, I I do some things wrong in my life. I've got some sins and I admit they're sins, uh, that they're not right. And I know according to the Bible, they're wrong, but I'm doing them. They're part of my life, and I don't see any judgment. I don't see any bad uh, results or consequence. I don't see any lightning coming out of the sky. Hey, there's nothing to this. Yeah, there is. God's giving you time to repent of those sins, though, and to turn. That's why it's his long suffering. So number one, God delays judgment. That's an evidence of his reaching out to us. Number two, God sends prophets And he sends, in our case, pastors, missionaries, Christians. He sends people up to our house or in our work, and they get a track. They receive a track. But did you know that God will not directly talk to you? 
You know, when you come up to a, a place where you start to get serious about spiritual things, you have to realize that God will not directly talk to you, but what God will do is send people to talk to you. In the Old Testament, we see the prophets time and time again. In the New Testament, we see the Apostle Peter, we see the Apostle Paul, we see the uh, Ethiopian being witnessed to in that desert there because God sends somebody to him. A friend, you have to realize, understand something here. When God is trying to reach us, he's going to send people into our lives to tell us about the Lord and to tell us about the Bible and to tell us about our spiritual needs and yes, to invite us out to church. Now, please listen to me this morning. This is God trying to reach out to you. He uses people. He uses the prophets in the Old Testament. God will not directly speak to you. Uh, he'll send pastors. He'll send other Christians. He'll send individuals. And you really need to listen to them. And their faults and the little flaws they might have and the personality quirks. And we all have them. Except for me. So you're, you're loosening up a little now. That's good. That's what I tell people. Except for, except for you and me, everybody's something. Except for you and me. But you can look at their faults. You can look at their failings. You can look at some of the things they're not perfect in. And you can nitpick if you want. You, you can uh, fault find if you want. But please understand something. What you're doing is you're discounting what God is trying to do in your life. And you're discounting that God's trying to reach you. Don't do that. As long as these people are telling you what thus saith the Lord is, please listen to them. Don't get your focus of attention on their faults and their failings and some of the things they might have done wrong in the past. Listen to what they have to say. Because even imperfect men can tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. So God sends prophets. That's another way that God tries to reach out to us. Number three, another way God tries to reach out to us, and does, by the way, is he does all the time, constantly, continually, without stopping. Psalm 19, verse 1. It says here that not only does God reach us through people, but he reaches us through nature, tries to reach out to us through nature. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament, which is this earth, showeth his handiwork. That's talking about nature in particular. It says, showeth his handiwork. Then verse 2 says, day unto day uttereth speech. Every day, every day, you're being talked to by God. Every day, you're being reached out to by God. How? Through his creation. His creation speaks. That's what Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2 and 3 say. Uh, verse 2 again, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That means nobody in this world cannot hear this. Verse 4, their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and is circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. You know what this means? Every day that the sun comes up, and that even happens in Cleveland, Ohio once in a while. Every day that the sun comes up, it's telling you something. It's speaking to you. It's, it's a picture of God Almighty and God's a Son. Every day that the sun comes up, it's talking to people and saying there is a God. And it's a God that made this creation. Every part of it, every part of it here, this world. And so there's a constant and continuous reminders. There was one time I was on block work and I was doing an area between East 222nd and Babbitt Road. There's some condominiums in that area uh, where the roads come to. But just before you get to the V there, there's some condominiums there. And I was just knocking on the doors. I went to the back doors because I thought they'd come more readily to the back door than the front door. So I was doing the inner, inner part there. And I knocked on one door and, and the guy opened up the door. And I said, hi, I'm from uh, Bible Baptist Temple. I'm Pastor Andy Rusnacko. And I just want to invite you out to our church sometime. And he said, oh, no, not here, too. And he closed the door, 
And that was the end of that call. <laughs> it went pretty quick. But I thought, isn't that interesting what he said? He said, oh no, not here, Euclid, to T-O-O, also. Now, I, I took that to mean that he must have moved from somewhere else, or maybe he was, he was a witness to, or he had people knocking on his door there, but now he moved to Euclid, Ohio, and he said, not here, too. He was tired of it there, and he didn't want to hear it here, either. What is that, though? It's a continuous witness he had. Whether, wherever it is he moved from, and now he's in Euclid, Ohio, and he's hearing the same thing. Why? That's God trying to reach out to him. I like having a sign out front here. You know how many people drive by and see our, our church sign, outside church sign there? I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands every day, every day. A lot of those people, it's the same people driving by because they're probably going to work and coming from work and they probably go down the same road uh, at least five days a week. So they see the sign out front all the time. And that's a constant and continual reminder. Nature itself is a constant and continual reminder. Our little church sign there is a constant and continual reminder. And what does the sign say right now? Still connected with Mother's Day. And the one side says, a virtuous woman. Who can find a virtuous woman? There was one lady walking by the church as I was driving by that, how do you say this? She needed that sign. Amen. I don't know how many times she walked by her church, but every time she walked by her church, at least these last few weeks, she'll see that sign. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Hmm. What is that? That's a reminder, isn't it? Constant, continual. Just having a little church sign out there. Just all the churches around. Isn't that a constant and continual reminder to people that there is something to our spiritual life, that there is, is some God, and that church is probably some kind of Christian church, whether it's Baptist church or some other kind. But it's a constant and continual reminder that these churches are here, and they know what it means. And there's a constant and continual reminder that, that life is short uh, because they drive by funeral homes all day long, too. There's all kinds of funeral homes around. And that's a reminder that, that you're not going to live forever in this world. And there's hospitals all around the place. And they drive by Cleveland Clinic and University Hospital and all the other different hospitals around. And that's a reminder that your physical body is, is decaying and your physical body is giving up. And you're not uh, going to get healthier as the years go by. There will come a time, probably, most likely, when you will need a hospital. Why? Because our physical bodies are going. Constant and continual reminders. Nature is. Yeah, I thought about that. It said there in Psalm 19 again that every day the sun comes up. Or every day another day goes by. And, and the whole uh, cycle of, of this planet and all of the laws of nature and so forth. Which really are God's laws. That every day is a reminder that there is a God. You know, I, I counted this up last night. I hope I did my mathematics and my multiplication right. I figure most people live, let's say average of 70 years. Let's just use that as a round number, 70 years. And there's 365 days in each year. Now, if every day is a reminder about God and a testimony to his existence, then if you multiply 365 days in the year, times 70, say an average lifetime, that means the average person has been witnessed to by this creation and by the sun coming up and going down in God's nature. If you multiply 365 times 70, you come up with 25,550. You know something, friend? I think 25,550 opportunities to be saved is more than fair. 25,000. And that's just nature and the testimony of nature. So God's reaching out to people. Uh, God's trying to reach people spiritually is constant and continual. That's what he's trying to do. Every time you drive by a, a, a funeral home, every time you drive by a hospital, or you're in a hospital, every time you drive by a church, it's a reminder. Every day that sun comes up, it's a reminder. God's reaching out to people through these mean, means. Number four. Here's another, another thing that shows God's outstretched arm. 
God is long-suffering and patient, waiting for our repentance. We already mentioned that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that God wants us to repent, turn from our sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But God is long-suffering. What is God waiting for? Waiting for us to repent. This is a, a vindication of God when people criticize him. When people say, well, I don't believe in that God that allows this, and I don't believe in a God that allows death, and why are there all these problems in this life, and why do I have the problems I have in my life? This is a vindication that God is a good God, contrary to what some people try to claim he is. The God of the Bible is a good God, but he's also a holy God. There must be a turning from sin. There must be an admitting that God is holy and we are sinful. That's what the Bible says. We need to understand that. That God is long-suffering, and that's a vindication of God. That's a vindication that God is right and we are wrong. That is a vindication that God is a good God while we are sinners. And people that would care to, to ridicule and would care to criticize God because he's not doing things the way they want. Friends, this is the way God reaches out to us, by not giving us what we want. To keep us disillusioned. And that's not the best word, but that's what I'm going to use this morning. To keep us disillusioned about this life. Because God's got something far better in the future. Far better. So God is long-suffering, patient, and waiting for our repentance. Waiting for us to turn, to ch turn uh, from running away to him, from him to turning towards him. Number five, another evidence that God is reaching out to us. God shows us the consequences of sin and rebellion. God shows us consequences of sin. We see Bible examples of this in Samson. What was the problem there? His immorality. He wanted a girlfriend more than he wanted the Lord. That's a problem. That's a problem today, isn't it? Young people are driven to have a boyfriend or girlfriend. Unless you do it for some reason, uh, they think they're a failure. If they don't have a girlfriend or boyfriend, uh, so what? Put the Lord first. Be careful in that area, young people, especially. David, what a bad example he was a couple times. Good example in so many ways, but a bad example. In, in what he did. Don't make his mistake. Don't get caught up in immorality like David did. Don't fall. What a great king he was. A man after God's own heart. He's the one that defeated Goliath. He's the one that people loved. He's the one that God loved. And look what he did. It messed up his family. His son murdered somebody else and his son was killed in battle. All because it started and began with David's sin. Look at the example he set there. Don't make the same mistake. Look at King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. What a couple they were. Amen? Look at Miriam when she criticized that God made her a leper. Look at Gehazi, a type of lepros uh, leprosy there too. Leprosy being a type of sin. Look at Israel as a nation too. Read in Luke chapter 17 verse 32 where it says, there's only three, let's see, three words in that verse. Luke 17 32. Anybody know what that verse is? Remember Lot's wife. Let me ask you this. Have you done that? Have you done that this last week? Have you remembered Lot's wife this last week? Ever crossed your mind this last week? Uh, yeah, remember Lot's wife, what happened to her? She turned into pillar of salt, all because she turned around and looked in the wrong direction. She didn't even go in the wrong direction. She was going in the right direction, but she looked back as she was going one direction. She looked back in the other direction and turned into a pillar of salt. Did you remember that this week? See, the Bible says we're to remember that. We remember that all the time. Did you remember that or did you forget her this week? I think we all forgot her. I forgot her until I was doing the, uh, the notes for this message. Why do you think God reminded us of Lot, or Lot's wife? Because of her sin, her desire and love for this world. She longed after this world. 
You see, God tries to show us the consequences of sin. He tries to show us uh, the people in the Bible that did things wrong, why it was wrong, and we should learn from that. Here's an interesting thought. You know that after all these years that mouse traps, you ready for this great illustration this morning? That mouse traps still work. You say, Pastor, what are you getting at? I'm just saying that mouse traps still work. Don't those mice ever learn? <laughs> Why do mouse traps still work after all these years? I don't know when they invented that mouse trap. You know, when that goes, you know, snap, put the little cheese or meat or whatever it is would attract the mouse there. Uh, why don't those mice ever learn? I mean, they're still gullible. Uh, they still get trapped in mouse traps. You think they'd learn after all these years, but they've never learned. Why is that? Because they're stupid. <laughs> why don't people learn after all these years? But that's why. I mean, we're shown the, the evidences and the consequences of sin in the Bible. Uh, we see the example of Samson and David and Ahab and Jezebel. We see the example of a Peter, some of the mistakes he made. And yet we continue to do the same mistakes. Satan does not need a new kind of mousetrap. He still uses the same old mousetrap, and it still works. Why? Because we are, and I'm not going to say it, you fill in the blank. Let me ask this question, then why do you do the same things that these people did? Why do you get caught up in maybe some kind of immorality? Why do you get caught up in cheating and stealing? Why do you get caught up in some of these things that the Bible says are wrong? Why do you, you know why? Because we don't remember Lot's wife. We forgot all about her last week. We forgot all about her last month. Probably for years we haven't even thought about Lot's wife. And we should be remembering what happened to her. She was walking in the right direction, but her desire and her heart was back there. And when she turned around turned into a pillar of salt. Why don't people learn? Because we got that old sin nature and we're prone to make the same things. But God tries to reach out to us and plead with us, don't make these mistakes. Let David be an example for you. Let King Ahab be an example for you. Let Samson be an example. Learn from others' mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes like that stupid mousetrap. Don't fall for it time and time and time again. Consequences of sin rebellion. So God tries to reach out. He tells us what happens to these good people. I mean, even Christian people in the Bible. He shows us their examples when they do wrong, the problems that come because of their wrongdoing, even as Christians. Even as Christians. So understand that. Learn from these other mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes they did. God's given you and shown you the examples. And even in this life, too, so many people caught up in the wrong things. And then another way he tries to reach out to us, where he shows his patience in putting up with mankind's insults, slights, neglect, mocking, mockings. And blasphemies. Turn to Matthew chapter number 12. Let me show you this verse here. Because uh, we need to be forgiven for these things, of course. But these are the things that people do and say against God. You know, there's things I've heard over the years that I will not ever repeat. I would not even repeat as a bad example while I'm preaching a message like this morning. I'm not going to bring up some of the things that some people have said about God. There's a certain amount of humor in it. It could even be uh, kind of funny. But when it blasphemes God and it belittles him and it makes him look wrong and makes him look bad, I don't even want to use them as a bad example because I'd be embarrassed to even say some of those things. I don't tell Jesus jokes. Any joker says, well, Paul and Peter and Jesus are walking down the road. I don't want to hear any of those jokes. You say, well, it wasn't all that bad. Yes, it is that bad. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. It is that bad. I will not stand for any mocking of our God. Hollywood does it all the time. They can have that Saturday Night Live. They can have that church lay down there that just mocks, uh, mocks Christianity and mocks our good churches and mocks the, the things of God. I don't want to have anything to do with it. So I won't even give you any bad examples this morning of what this is about. But I know this. There's such a great disrespect of God in America today. How can he bless it? 
God bless America. He can't. He can't bless a people that's neglecting him. He won't even go to church or read his Bible. They'll mock him on all their Hollywood, in, through Hollywood, by going to see these movies that mock God and watching television where much of that is just mocking God and the Bible. Ridicule, ridicule. It is a strong weapon against someone. We see some of that in the Bible, some ridicule against the, the, the false gods. God even used ridicule, talking about, let's say, let these gods stand up and show how good they are, how strong they are by prophesying about the future. God even used some of that against the false, false gods and false beliefs and against Israel at times too. Yet yeah, it's mocking and ridicule is a powerful weapon. I don't like it when they use it against my God. You want to make me angry, that'll do it. Don't tell me these jokes. I don't even like jokes about heaven. You need to consider and think about those times that you've made a joke and made a mockery of God or his word or his heaven. See, God, though, our God is so wonderful. Our God is more patient than I would be. I would slap somebody. <laughs> My God is more long-suffering. You know why he's patient and long-suffering? Because he loves us. And he wants people to be saved. And he'll take it for a while. He's also holy, though. He's a holy God. And those that do not honor his son, God will not honor. He will bring a judgment eventually. But we've got a little time here from the time we're born to the time that we die. We've got some time here to make things right and to make things right with God and to start to honor him instead of dishonoring him. To start to praise him and worship him instead of mocking him and ignoring him and neglecting him. See, God, though, is so wonderful. He puts up with more than I would. Have you ever been insulted? Now, as kids, as young people, we get all, uh, you know, as young kids, we, we name call and we do other things against each other. And there's times you might get mad because if somebody uses enough names against you and they call you a certain name that kind of gets to you and activates your emotion, activates your anger, you're going to want to do something. And that's what causes fights to break out. But our God is so much more patient and long-suffering because he is, he is those things because he's loving. God is not willing that any should perish. Anybody. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Change that attitude from God uh, of mocking him or at least neglecting him to honoring him and worshiping him and coming out to church. Amen. That's my commercial. Coming out to church. On Sundays. Amen. Well, that shows that God's arms are outstretched. He puts up with these insults. I don't know who it was that did that church lady thing, but that used to infuriate me. And I never watched that. I never watched that program. But, but you know, our God is so loving. If that individual, if he would repent and turn to Jesus Christ, you answer this question. Would Jesus Christ, would God the Father forgive him and save him, or would he not forgive him and save him? Yes, sir. He certainly would. He certainly would. As much as he mocked God and mocked churches and mocked Christianity, God would forgive him. That's our God. That's our God. That's God's outstretched arm trying to reach out to us by putting up with the insults, by putting up with the neglect, by putting up with the mocking. And then lastly this morning, another way that God reveals his outstretched arm is by God increasing intensity to get mankind's attention. What does that mean? If one thing doesn't work to try to reach us, God will try something else. And the something else is a little harsher, a little more intense. If the goodness of God isn't going to work when reaching people, then God's going to heat up the flame a little bit. Turn it up a little higher. 
Revelation, Revelation chapter 16, verse 9. Last book in the Bible, last book in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 16, verse 9. You see, everything that happens to you in this world, Christian uh, and non-Christian, remember this, everything that happens to you in this world, God's in back of it. Everything that happens to you in this world, God has a reason for it. We don't always know what the reason is, but he does, and he's wiser than we are, and so I'm content with that. And so God is always trying to reach people. If the goodness of God would not cause us to repent, then God changes things around and he sends us problems, he sends us difficulties, he sends us tribulation. Maybe then someone will turn to God. And that's what's happening in the book of Revelation. We talk about the book of Revelation in the seven years and all the holocausts that have come on and all the problems and, and the lightning come out of heaven, all these uh, 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 physical disasters, all these natural disasters going to happen, and they are going to happen. But why is God doing this? Is this his judgment? Well, yes, it's his judgment also. But look at verse number 9 now, Revelation chapter 16. I want to show you another reason that God is allowing this and bringing all these things. He's turning up the heat. And men were scorched with great heat. This is the tribulation period. And blasphemed the name of God. They went the wrong direction which had power over these plagues. They blasphemed God, and God was the remedy. Isn't that what it says? That's what it means. God was the remedy. They blasphemed the God of heaven, who could have changed everything, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. You know what God's trying to do here? Trying to get these people to repent. Like 2 Peter 3, 9. So they'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God's turned up the heat. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? See, friend, God's after you. He wants you to repent. His will is that you get saved. His will is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to do whatever he has to. His hands, his arms are outreached to you. They're pleading with you. They're, they're doing things in your life to draw you to him. Will you recognize that this morning? Will you realize that this morning? That's what God is trying to accomplish here. He's trying to reach people that they'll be saved. God doesn't want anybody lost. He wants everybody in heaven. Friends, I've told you before, I'll tell you again. Heaven is big enough for everybody. Heaven's big enough. And God wants you there. Then what's the problem? You are and your love of sin. You don't want to honor and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to turn to him with all your hearts. That's where the problem is. As much as God is reaching out to you and calling out to you and desiring that you be saved, he wants you in heaven. That's his desire. But if we choose the other way, God says, okay, you've finalized this decision. There will come a judgment because a God of love is also a God of holiness. And there has to be judgment uh, for those who have done wrong. And there will be. But the problem with that is you don't have to be in that category. You can be saved. Let me ask you one question. Now do you see how much God is reaching out to you? Amen. Father, please bless now as we give a verse of invitation. I, I, Lord, I pray that spiritual needs will be met this morning. Amen. Father, please. I. I pray that we'll recognize and see how many times you've been reaching out to us, trying to get our attention, trying to get us to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To change from neglect to worship. From mocking to revering. So please bless, work in our hearts, give us what we need this morning. Bless this invitation time. That there may be even one, or I'm sure there's several here today that, still, that need this. They need to realize you're reaching out to them through individuals, through maybe even this message this morning. So please, we pray for these souls. And I pray people today will understand that if they haven't believed in the Lord, it's them that need to make the decision and call out to him. Use this invitation time for whatever spiritual needs are here this morning.